The windmill is a curious thing, completely built by art of man, to grind the corn for man and beast, that they alike may have a feast. The mill she is built of wood, iron and stone. Therefore, she cannot go alone. Therefore, to make the mill to go, the wind from some part she must blow. she, always feminine, complex, sometimes exasperating, sometimes even dangerous. Pagan a mill in Suffolk. Fifty years ago, England had hundreds of windmills. Pakenham is one of a tiny few today which still grind the corn for man and beast. The sails, which as a rule are called sweeps south of the Thames, are most often made of pitch pine. The fantail winds the mill by means of gearing, keeping the sails always in the eye of the wind. The immensely strong wind shaft carries the brake wheel. This is a wooden one with cogs of apple wood, a favourite material for gear teeth. As time went on, more and more of the machinery was made of cast iron. The brake wheel is geared to the upright shaft by means of the wallower, the name always used for the first driven wheel in any mill. Lower down the upright shaft, the stones. Sometimes as many as five pairs. The bottom or bedstone remains still, the runner stone turns. The space between them is set by the miller. A governor keeps this constant however fast the mill goes. The first definite reference to an English windmill was made about 800 years ago and it referred to a mill at Bury St Edmunds only a few miles from Pakenham. Pictures of early mills survive in medieval manuscripts. And there are carvings like this pew end at Thornham in Norfolk. There's a mill on the wall soak and brass in St Margaret's Church, King's Lynn. It's becoming faint now from the tread of centuries and more recently from the attentions of enthusiastic brass rubbers. At Norwich Cathedral, there's a miller, his horse and his mill on one of the superb painted bosses in the cloister. In the Middle Ages, the miller was a stock figure of fun, characterized as lazy and dishonest, even quite wrongly as stupid. An honest miller, it was said, has a tuft of hair in the palm of his hand. This probably reflects the envy felt towards the prosperous man in a small peasant community. One vindictive neighbour, a woman, was even prepared to set his mill afire. These early illustrations show post mills. The whole body containing the machinery turns round to face the wind. The earliest surviving mill, dated 1636, is at Bourne in Cambridgeshire, a typical post mill of the period. The great post is held central by timber cross trees, usually resting on brick-built piers. Diagonal quarter bars throw the sheer weight of the mill out to the end of the cross trees. At second floor level, the post is socketed into the crown tree, the horizontal beam upon which the whole mill is built and most carefully balanced.
Bourne Mill has been taken over and preserved by the Cambridge Preservation Society. Perhaps one day she'll turn again. It wouldn't take much. A spread of canvas on the sails and away she'd go. These are called common sails. The post mill at Drinkston in Suffolk has two common and two spring sails. She's still worked by her owner, Wilfred Clover, one of a famous family of East Anglian millers. My father put me in charge of the women at the age of 15, and I'm now 61. In all that time, I think I've learned everything there is to learn about the wind. Before spreading the cloth on the common sails, I have to judge the strength of the wind, because I, if I spread too much out, she'll be overdriven, and something may give way under the strain. On the other hand, if I take in too much, her speed will be too low, and she won't grind fast enough. And sometimes, of course, I'm caught in a squall unawares with all the camera spread upon the sails, then I have to make a mad rush for the brake rope, pull her up, in order to take some cameras off the sails. And sometimes, before I'm able to do that, the brake smokes, and the smell of burn wood fill the mill, before I'm able to bring it to the point of the rest. And then I have to rush out, and haste this, scrap the cameras off the sails, in case the brakes give way on the strain, and do each sail in turn. Then I have to ascend the steps again to release the brake. Then perhaps after the squall has passed, the wind drops, the speed is too low, I have to stop her once more, go down and spread the cameras out and up the steps once more and release the brake in order to set her going again. So as you see, there's a lot of work attached to these canvas sails compared with their automatic shutter sails. The hook which holds the shutter sails in an open position have to be released, then the shutters adjust the means for spring so that the shutters open under a certain pressure of the wind so help to check the speed of the mill. This ingenious method of winding a mill came with the invention of the fantail by Edmund Lee rather more than 200 years ago. Before this, she had to be turned round by the miller's own effort, manhandled by means of a tail pole, for example, as Rawby Post Mill in Lincolnshire still is. Five years ago, she was derelict, but she's been put back into working order by John Sass and his group of dedicated enthusiasts the Rawby Post Mill Preservation Society. They also had help from the Ministry of Works and the Lincolnshire County Council. The roof of the roundhouse here revolves with the mill, a peculiarity found only in Lincolnshire. No roundhouse, by the way, actually supports the mill, but it makes a useful store place. Rawby is the last working post mill in a county which once had close on a thousand windmills of all kinds. Over Norfolk, on the dry and windy side of England, the air blows clean and sharp. 
but thousands of its flat acres lie below sea level and can be cultivated only because of the windmills that pumped the water from marsh and fen and kept them from becoming soaked. In the 19th century, there were a hundred drainage mills on this part of the marshes alone, where the rivers Yare and Waveney and Bure join Braden Water close to Great Yarmouth. They were tower mills built of brick, only the cap and sails turning to face the wind. You have to travel by boat to reach the one at Burney Arms. She's the largest of all the marsh mills and was recently restored for the Ministry of Works by the Norfolk millwright Cecil Smithdale of Acor. I've known Burney Arms Mill for over 60 years. I used to drain water from the marshes, but its surplus power uh, also used to make the materials for cement. It was mud taken from Braden with some of the uh, shells of the fish, like mussels, all mixed up with the chemicals which they added to the material. It made a very, very hard cement, and the colour was blue. The scope wheel is one of the largest on any drainage mill in East Anglia. I've heard it said that she would move somewhere around a thousand tons of water an hour. This I am sure, after certain tests were made, to be correct. The windmill done a very good job of work in its day, there's no doubt about it. It was our only method of draining and preserving this rich pasture land. I practically rebuilt this mill uh, with the exception of the brick tower. It's uh, really unique in its way. It's, I think, the highest drainage mill in Norfolk. Bernie's boat-shaped cap is a superb example of typical Norfolk practice. Her tall, beautifully proportioned tower must be a welcome sight to sailors clearing Brayton on their way from the continent to Norwich. in Cambridgeshire, acres of wild fen are preserved by the National Trust, just as they were before they were cultivated. Once, the land was kept dry by dozens of mills. The little one at Wickham is deliberately preserved, it's true, but it's a small example of that army of windmills upon which the fens once relied to keep them from drowning. Call her a smock mill, a kind of tower mill with a wooden body, usually hexagonal. Traditionally painted white, they suggested the old-fashioned smocks worn by countrymen.
Smog mills were commonest south of the Thames, though they could be found wherever timber was rarely plentiful. Cranbrook in Kent is a superb example. Its construction echoed in the style of many of the buildings that cluster round it. Windmills display many local variations and peculiarities. Although four sails were usual, five and six were not uncommon. Hackington in Lincolnshire has eight, now idle, though the mill itself is beautifully preserved and could be made to work. Sutton Bridge, there's the ghost of a sick sailor. At Walford, near the coast of Lincolnshire, there's a great five sailor still grinding. She belongs to Frederick Banks of Curtin Lindsay. A mill such as this is operated by what we call a striking chain, which hangs down at the back of the mill. From that point, the sails are all operated at the same time through a striking rod which passes through the centre of the wind shaft. From that one point on that striking chain, you operate all the sails at the same time. And as long as your sails are, are properly adjusted, then of course automatically as the wind blows, the amount of weight that you have on your striking chain decides the amount of uh, power that you're going to produce. Uh, for one pair of stones, for instance, you would use uh, one bucket weight, and then uh, for other stones, you would add more weights too. This particular mill, it was built in uh, 1837. It was built for the making of flour, and of course a mill that is built for that purpose is built uh, generally higher with the stones up in the second or third floor, so that the meal can come down through the dressing machines, and as it reaches the bottom, well, the operation is completed. With windmilling, you have to be uh, a bit more alive than you are with a lot of the modern machinery that uh, is used for grinding today because of course a windmill you control it entirely by uh, the amount of feed that's going into the stones if one bit of straw gets into the feed there's an increase of speed straight away so that uh, when a windmill is in proper, properly in operation you can't just walk away and leave it and forget about it i have run three pairs of stones here but uh, I haven't had all four going. I hope to uh, have them all going sometime when I can just get it uh, arranged. They're all in working order and the mill would turn four pairs but of course they wouldn't be very heavily loaded. The Five Sailor is the last of four windmills that once worked in and around Alford. This town is the home of Jack Thompson, another of the few millwrights still active. He and his brother Bob have restored mills in every part of the country. This type of sail takes us about a fortnight to make each sail, take it overall. Uh, that, of course, is after you've got the main timber bed sawn out and such like. Uh, these sails are going down to uh, Icklesham. It's about midway between Hastings and uh, Rye. Uh, when they get there, they've been overlooking the channel. I can't be absolutely accurate, but uh, we do claim that they were the only millwrights left that's doing full-time windmill work. I think I've gone nearly through it. I've been, I've been at it now for nearly... You're getting along with under 70 years, you know. <laughs> 667, isn't it? And uh, we, uh, well, of course, we do take everything uh, more or less in our stride, you see. Even down to casting brass, brass bearings. 
the art of stone of dressing a stone is, of course, you've got to have it on a perfect face, you see. You have what we call a staff. That is a piece of timber which you cover with uh, red ochre or any marking material. You work that round on the stone, and when you've marked it round, you chop the little pieces that's already marked and, and then go again until it gets marked all over. That gets it on a true face. <coughs> then, of course, you've got to knock out the back edges of the furrows, and you finish off with the chisel. And you just simply tap away to, until you've got the furrow cut out clean. If Alford's five sailor seems unusual to people in the south, there's a mill over at Chesterton in Warwickshire which is odd beyond all question. Here again, a few dedicated young men are patiently bringing her back to full working order. Their leader is Derek Ogden, who works as an electrical engineer in Birmingham and has been commissioned by the Warwickshire County Council to restore Chesterton in his spare time. From a distance, you could easily mistake her for a water tower. She was long thought to have been designed by Inigo Jones, but that isn't so. She was built in 1632 for Sir Edward Pito, Jones's friend and pupil. Why did he choose to build her to such an unusual design with her floors supported on stone arches? Well, it's almost certain that she wasn't intended to be a mill at all, but was originally built as an observatory or even as a summer house. Last year, Ogden and his companions made and installed a new oak wind shaft weighing two tons, the first time anything like it had been done for something like a hundred years. Now they're making a new brake wheel and finishing a timber rack 18 feet in diameter on which the cap and sails will be moved round by a hand winch. The rack's being made in sections of Derek Ogden's home, an old water mill near Ulster. Here too, they are making the four new sails with which, in a few months' time, Chesterton Mill will once again proudly face the wind. It's only the work of a few real enthusiasts and millers themselves, often supported by national and local authorities and preservation societies, that's saving the English windmill from total extinction. At Over, near Cambridge, Chris Wilson has bought an old tower mill and is restoring it single-handed. I've always had feeling for old things, buildings, machinery, and while the thing functions properly and is quite economic as such, I just see no reason why the old things should be suddenly cut down and destroyed. Now, there are times when I go up there, it's that cold, uh, up and stood several minutes thinking, what shall I do? And so I get on with it, and after a little while, I forget about the cold. I've been making my own sails for the mill, which I'm putting on now. So I've talked to a lot of old millers and millwrights. The more I've got the idea from them, and told them what to do. I hope I get some grinding to do, but even if I don't, it gives me a real pleasure to see the mill with the sails majestically sweeping round in a breezy day. When Chris Wilson has finished his work, no doubt plenty of us will visit over Mill to admire and be grateful, to wish perhaps that we had something of his enterprise. For a working windmill, once an everyday sight, is nowadays enough to stop most of us in our tracks.
the children of Watfield Primary School in Suffolk travelled across the county to see the mill at Saxted Green. I was very excited when we saw the mill for the first time. The sails were going round and the sun was shining. Saxton Mill is 46 feet high. The sails weighed five tons and from the tip to tip of the sails it was 54 feet 9 inches. Saxton Mill is white with a blue fantail. If the fantail went round, the top part went round. Round the outside of the mill there is a wooden track. It comes about 10 feet out from the mill base and when there is a fair bit of wind, the steps move round. When we walked round the windmill, it looked as if the sails were going to hit you. I thought the mill was going to be bigger. I'd seen pictures and they looked bigger. The steps up to the back are white and there are about 45, at least 30. When we climbed to the top of the windmill, the steps were ever so steep. I went right up to the top of it, where all the cogs were. There were big ones and also little ones, and near the cogs there were some grinding stones. This was quite dark at the top of the windmill, but there was just one little window which a little light would come in. I enjoyed my visit to Saxted Mill. Saxted Green must be one of the prettiest and best preserved mills in the country, thanks again to local effort backed by official support. But for every happy site like this, there are scores of old rotten stumps beyond the help of even the wildest enthusiast. Not all died of old age, some blew down in gales. Many caught fire from the friction of the brake when a squall took the miller by surprise. The English windmill will survive for a few more years yet. A handful working commercially on a pitifully narrow profit margin until their present owners retire. A few more preserved by the small number of people who care. A source of increasing astonishment to future generations. But the vast majority stand mute, like stones in a scattered graveyard to remind us of the England that was killed by the Industrial Revolution.